Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your host for today. I'm David Phil. Uh, my role is I work at ACOM as I'm Global BIM Consultancy Director, but I'm also one of the Vice Chairs of the Constru Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. So my job today, welcome you here to the first in the series of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre's ICON series of online events. So what's ICON about? Well, ICON Innovation and Construction was created to support the industry through these challenging times and then we're facing a very different future. And you'll see in the chat platform today, the various links to the different parts of the funding and the online learning platform. But today we want to explore with this session the opportunities that will still help us restart. And I think also to actually to reinvent the industry and talk about how we're going to be more resilient. How do we actually maintain value for money? And actually, how do we maintain a focus on transformation as needed in terms of both a low carbon agenda and how to make sure that we've got innovative solutions that's going to actually help our industry, not just in the short, the short term, but also in terms of resetting as well. So as you'll see, we've got a rather esteemed panel today that really represent very different aspects of our sector within there. You'll meet them over the currency of our webinar. Skills is obviously a big, important topic of today as well. And unfortunately, Douglas can't be with us. Uh, we're just trying to make maximize amount of time within there. But there's a program of specific skills-focused events and activity as part of the wider ICON program and the wider project work that's been carried out by CSIC. So Douglas has kindly given up his space to allow a bit more time for conversation as well within there. Today is actually a bit easier for me as well as your host because in terms of housekeeping, number one, if you do need the toilet, I'm sure you'll find your way to it quite easily. Uh, if you want to know the Wi-Fi passcode, I'm sure it'll be written in the back of the fridge or somewhere as well up there. But actually, in the currency of today's webinar, if you do want to ask a question, please, you'll see on our GoToWebinar, there's a click on questions in the control panel. Type in your questions, uh, myself and the team will be uh, watching out for them as well within there. We will try to answer as many as we can during the webinar today. But obviously, your feedback and opinion is extremely valuable. So we'll try and take all questions and comments to the board, even if we can answer it during this 45 minutes as well. One of the things we will be doing is recording the session and it will be available on the CSIC channels and it will be sent to all participants afterwards as well. One of the things you will see over the current of the 45 minutes is a couple of poll questions that will pop up, they'll come through. Please, if you can answer, because I think that, you know, it's going to be quite interesting as well. So you'll see them pop up and if you can answer it and then we actually inform part of our question sets as well through there. But keep your eye on the chat panel and you'll see much more information popping up about the icon as well within there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do an introduction to you can see our esteemed panelists in there. And we're going to give all panelists two minutes just to see who they are, introduce themselves to yourself, but also for them to actually tell you what they see as the biggest changes that they think industry will need to make. So Lynn, can I ask you first of all if you can join us and give your two minutes in terms of who you are and again, focus on the biggest challenges and the changes that you think industry needs to make. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lynn Sullivan. I'm an architect. Um, I'm a member of the UK government's Green Construction Board, and I chair something called the Good Homes Alliance. And uh, in that former role, uh, I've been doing work on how to respond to the grand challenges and the net zero pathway for building. So, uh, I, it, you know, obviously we've had other fish to fry over the last couple of months, but I do feel that once, um, you know, government stimulus um, starts to recover and we need to make a plan that's both green and to get construction back on its feet. Uh, I've been reading quite a lot of good reports on, not my specialist subject, but ec economics, looking at the sort of uh, multipli multipliers of economic investment and potentially we need investment in the industry which converts the, the sort of recovery stimulus into a long-term green plan uh, that delivers jobs and skills that we need for the future so I think that's the big thing for me is to dovetail those two things together particularly in relation to the net zero agenda so um, I would say you know the big thing there is to invest in training and skills, particularly thinking about um, re energy reporting and measurement as our kind of core uh, validation really of, of our success as an industry or not in the context of net zero. Uh, and, you know, 
we haven't been used to that. We've been used to the idea of labeling of buildings and uh, design performance, but I think we really need to move this to this culture of in-use performance and um, and particularly in, in retrofit that um, it's always thought to be too difficult, but actually with our wonderful world of big data and um, you know mi micro you know sensors and, and so on, it's quite possible to understand exactly where energy in a building is going and I think that's that's the absolute key thing for me is to move to that culture of, of understanding and that will be a long-term investment for us. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much for that. So a big focus still on in terms of uh, being able to better measurement, especially how that ties into a Gen Zero requirements as well. So Mark, over to you, Finger, in this introduction again, what you see is the biggest changes that you think industry needs to make as well. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Mark Farmer. I'm Chief Executive of CAST. Um, I also um, act as the UK government's MMC champion for home building. Uh, as well as being a board member of CSIC, I'd hasten to add. Uh, so great to be participating in this uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I think the key issue for me in the period ahead is everyone has to hold their nerve. So it's clearly we are in difficult, uncertain times. No one's quite sure what the future holds from a business perspective and from a, a wider economic perspective. But uh, I think it's really important that that we do hold our nerve in terms of the decisions we make over the coming weeks and months, which would be very easy to default back to business as usual, batten down the hatches, think about today, not tomorrow. And that, I, you know, I get all of that, that's human nature. I run my own private business. So I know as a CEO what the pressures are in terms of decision-making when you have uncertain times ahead of you. But I think it's just really important to remain focused on what, what you're going to have to do to navigate these difficult times and more importantly um, come out the other side and have a strong business or organization so so i think to an extent this is about leadership it's about behavior um, in terms of being able to be strong in the face of lots of um, reasons why you shouldn't do something whether it's investment in innovation in technology in new business models in recruitment even in terms of skills and training of different skill sets that, that, that I think are going to actually flourish in, in time ahead so I, I think it, it's that for me is the big thing that everyone's got to get focused on a lot of the tangible issues in terms of how we go about changing and what change looks like for individual businesses organizations i think that will come but it starts in the head and it starts with with that leadership and sense of behavioral alignment towards wanting to have a, a sustainable business thank you mark so a journey just not through restarting but the whole reinvention into longer term transformation and the importance of values, behaviours. Mari, if I could now come across yourself and ask you the same questions. Good morning, David. Good morning, listeners and viewers. Um, my name is Amy Matten. I'm a founder and executive chair of the Hale Urban Regeneration Company. We purposely position ourselves in economic areas with challenging economic conditions in communities throughout the whole of Scotland and UK and specifically town centres. I talk about tomorrow's world, and for me, uh, I'll speak about the Halo brand uh, later, but now's the time to create tomorrow's world at the forefront, putting construction and urban regeneration. We need to reset the economy with a kinder heart. We've seen what's happened over the last couple of weeks, so why not start taking that into business? And that can be driven through a net zero message, which we're currently doing at Halo. We've worked on it for 10 years. In the last year, three years in specific, we are key part of Scottish Power. We can create that new economy through clean tech and higher value jobs and economy. Government spending will cease, but let's ask the government to start spending money on clean, clean green economy for the construction industry. We talk about sustainable communities. Um, I work with some of the most deprived communities in the, uh, the whole of the UK, but especially Scotland and Kilmarnock, my hometown, where we're driving that net zero um, mission through carbon emissions and housing, an enterprise and innovation hub that's creating digital skills and new jobs. So it's for me now time to reach our community. Uh, it's difficult times for all, but as Mark has just said, it's about a uh, 
steady hands in ships and uh, there's plenty of opportunity out there for a great construction industry, the men and women who drive this economy and I'm really interested to learn more today from, from, from the panel. Great stuff. Thank you, Mary. I think some key themes coming out already is still about you know keeping the focus on carbon within there, the whole carbon economy, and again the importance of purpose and uh, value and leadership as well. So it's like university challenge down on my right hand side. Alexander, could you again same questions? Hi and good afternoon. Um, and thanks very much for giving your time up to listen to uh, this panel. Uh, so I work for the Scottish government's digital directorate and my primary role is looking at partnerships and opportunities and uh, particularly around the innovation space so when in a crisis what have we what have we learned from this what have we uh, seen going through the past two months and what we forecast coming out uh, the other side and what are the bits we want to keep what are the bits we want to um, rem leave behind and I think that um, this is a, uh, if anything, it's made us more human. And um, here I am working from my bedroom, or my son's bedroom, with a, uh, a one-year-old trying to nap next door. So please excuse any crying in the background. But, you know, if anything, digital is, what has taught us is that practices have changed in weeks that would otherwise have taken years to push through. You know, here we all are from our homes discussing this and particularly you know digital has proven to be a real enabler to how we work so what else can we achieve in weeks not years and to pick up on mark's point about the mindset you know in every crisis there is an opportunity and it's moving from the old ways of thinking of perhaps around value extraction what can we get out of this to a sense of value creation how can we collaborate with people we wouldn't necessarily have collaborated before with for the greater good and you can still make a profit with that mentality so there's a piece here absolutely man mindset and culture and the enabler of digital to be inclusive but also open ourselves up to ways of working and thinking we wouldn't necessarily have um, considered before so I'll talk a bit more about that in the next session. Thank you, Alexander. So let's not waste this crisis. I think seems to be one of the key themes that, that's coming across from the in digital. I think, as you said, has been you know, a key enabler so far within there as well. And great to have you. It looks as if you're on a tropical beach today. So thank you for joining <laughs> from your, uh, for, I'm sure, your lockdown uh, in, uh, in wherever it is. Yes, well, sadly, it's... Um... It's just Cumbernauld, but hey, we can all dream. Um, my name's Anne Johnston and I'm a partner at Hollis, which is a global real estate consultancy um, where I'm the head of the Environment, Energy and Sustainability Service. Um, so basically, I advise people with, mainly within the built environment um, on environmental liabilities and opportunities. Um, and one thing, you know, just echo everything that the panel has said so far, but um, one big change that I think the industry needs to make is to focus on how to improve the quality of existing building stock um, to meet net zero um, targets and also to adapt for climate change um, impacts, which are coming regardless of what we do now. Um, and also to put people at the heart of that, as Marie said, I think you know one thing that that has shown us is we need to think about what our buildings do for us and how they work for us and how we want them to work for us, um, and and really put that at the heart of the decisions that we make going forward. And thank you very much for that one with there. It's, it's interesting as well, thinking about our existing retained estate, how do we actually make our assets perform better, especially from a socio-technological view as well with clear purpose. So we're now going to come into a few more detailed questions. We've got questions coming in. And uh, let, let's first, if we can, go to Alexander from there. And, and Alexander, we've heard, I think, you know, from a few of the panellists there, that technology is obviously, you know, not just now, but it's, it's obviously had a major role to play and getting industry back to work already. It's helped us collaborate. As you said, it's helping us do things more quickly, more safely within there as well. 
And I think we're seeing it already being developed uh, to help us in terms of tracking, distancing within there, site management, and many other purposes. So, so the question to you is, how should clients and construction companies be viewing technology adoption? Will technology investments make now, will it support not just restart, but ultimately, will it help them go towards that wider transformation as well? Absolutely, David, and thank you. Well, I, I had a long chat with a friend of mine who's a director at a, a large property development and management company. They've got about 1.2 billion under um, management. And he was saying, actually, it's, what's been interesting is, again, from the working practices, uh, yes, they, they, they've changed the way, as we all have, in terms of how we work. But actually, they have seen digital as uh, a, a real enabler in many other ways. Um, when they're looking at the, pl the, the, the plotting of progress across numerous of their development sites, how else would they get a consistent overview of the progress without um, 3D mapping and imagery layered on layer day by day. Um, how else are they able to take people round buildings um, and, and, and market them uh, uh, when you now have, you, you're now able to do that virtually? And then when it comes to so the management of it, in terms of the application of sensors within the buildings, gives them a richness of data that enables them to reconfigure, reconfigure, rethink about how spaces are used. And if there's one thing that, that we've learned many things over the past few months, but there's the need of adaptability and flexibility. So if F1 teams can build ventilators and distilleries can build and produce hand sanitizing liquid, then, and we see, places like the Louisa Jordan Hospital being repurposed from a, uh, an event hall to uh, a hospital. We see there is a need for adaptability. And you know the construction industry has always been up there in terms of its, its uh, adherence to standards. But I think what we'll, we'll see is, is, as we think about our current assets we have, is how fit are they for a new environment not just against the backdrop of climate change and everything we were pushing absolutely uh, towards before uh, um, the crisis came along, but also in this requirement for COVID secure uh, environment, you know, how are our premises and work environments adapted and suitable to that? And what can we learn from hospitals about how they clean wards that now means the workplaces are going to be, have to be uh, uh, far more hygienic. So you know, that whole sense of flexibility and adaptability and that, that technological transposition. You know, how can we learn from other industries? And I gave those, those two examples um, earlier. But now we see people within the supply chain and um, Aritatech with, uh, with their wristbands have now developed a piece of kit that enables construction workers to work within social and physical distancing rules so that there is opportunity um, and I think that the, the 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 other aspect we come back to and, and a lot of my role the past four years has been helping the public sector think differently about how they in, engage particularly with smaller businesses and you know in the same way we encourage them to rethink their role and moving from this mentality of value extraction, what can we get out of this particular procurement, to value creation, how can we collaborate to create more public value? You know, what can the construction industry do in the same way and view themselves, ourselves, as a platform? And so it's almost using that purchasing power of the public purse as a platform for innovative, exportable technologies. So in this new world where everything needs to be rethought actually there is the opportunity to think more just wider than the simple asset that we're building but bringing in the supply chain new technologies and thinking of it as a well this is this is an export opportunity around new ways of working um, and and systems that manage that and so my final thing about, about genuine collaboration and inclusion so today with scotland is 
uh, SCONDES, which is the tech trade body, um, you know, we, we, we've launched a national challenge and it's how can we build the future of Scotland as a digital nation? And that's by harnessing technology and innovation to evolve current business models, drive efficiencies and productivity gains across the country. And the construction industry is right for that. So, you know, collaboration absolutely is at its heart. Great stuff, Alexander. Thank you for that. So not just technologies, but innovative use of data as well that's going to help us understand how our buildings, our assets are performed, but also our workforce as well. How do we actually use technology to help us with any changes in productivity level within there? And again, I think one of the big things that's coming through is that feedback loop. How do we keep learning through the data within there and how it can shape our decisions as well? So thank you for that one. So the next question is both to uh, uh, Marie and to Lynn. Uh, Marie, you can maybe go first with, an, uh, with this one as well. We mentioned a fair bit about uh, green construction and, the, and low carbon within there. Obviously, just now there's a lot of operational pressure on industry uh, within there. So, actually, you know, how can we continue to embrace uh, sustainable construction and net zero solutions, but within the context and the constraints of this value for money framework? Mary, do you want to go first, maybe? Yeah, surely. Um, yeah, I mean, our site closed on the 23rd of March, uh, like many sites. I mean, contracts as Morrison Construction, not until then we, we were going gung-ho. And uh, on, as I say this, Halo's uh, zero carbon vision of the future, um, we have been working on this site for 10 years, a former Diageo site we exited. And in the last few years in particular, it's about how do we create these new communities with a new vision and put net zero carbon at the forefront. And that journey continues for us uh, through our key partner, Scottish Power. Um, how we become sustainable uh, is grabbing the moment and, and creating net zero carbon emissions. Um, our project is the, the first and foremost project in Scotland. Um, we want to set standards with our brand. Um, this uh, approach will create that sustainable net zero community based around economic growth, digital skills and the enterprise and innovation hub. It will create employment opportunities up to 1,400 jobs and clean energy and housing, smart homes of the future with a, a healthcare provision. Uh, we currently are working with Community Pharmacy Scotland, looking at how can we integrate the pharmacy of the future into the houses of the future and take that data back into the Enterprise and Innovation Hub, where companies like Scottish Power or key partners like Barclays and BT will monitor data and in turn create new job opportunities for our young people and others um, working alongside some of our education partners. For me, it will be the sustainability of smart transport systems, working with e-cars and, and car clubs. And as, as Alexander said, as is an urban regeneration company, developers need to really look at their selling and the meaning of profit. Um, it's not all about making money, it's about taking that social capital, especially during these times of what we've learned and realigning that back into our projects. I mean, we work um, tirelessly with, with modest construction, and part of my remit when we went to tender was the economic values for the local community, and how when um, we have a, a, a planning gain, so to speak, that, that, that there will be a creation of jobs within the construction industry, um, for our bricklayers, electricians, administrators, but we are huge digital focus, because we need to, again, look at how what is the construction of the future on site and off site, and, and the great work that um, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre are doing alongside us. Um, we are piloting homes of the future there, um, off site manufacturing, working with some of the, the, the major companies across the UK. So, um, you know, we've got things like um, our deep battery storage, um, solar panels. So, there's a whole remit there and a whole focus on what other sectors within the construction industry we can bring in and learn from. Um, so, as, as I said, difficult times, but for me, um, if we align ourselves with some of the huge PLCs, bring them into especially our town centres, like what we've done at Halo, and align them with smaller businesses, SMEs, and get the expertise to them to help grow some of these businesses, that will in turn create an opportunity for companies like us to create other Halos across the whole of Scotland and beyond. We work with Scottish Government, UK Government. Um, you know, a, a lot of the issues um, going forward will be funding. And these sites are difficult to develop. Um, it took us 10 years to get a funding package in place. Um, the UK Government supported us with 3.5 million for innovation, 
Scottish Government three and a half million for infrastructure. So we need to look at clean government spending and we need to see how property developers in particular can relook at their models and as I talk about creating that economy with a kinder heart. Oh, David, I can't hear you. Hi, Lynn. I don't know if I can prove there yet. If you could just maybe just, just a short, uh, maybe if you have something you want to build on any of the points, uh, building on what Mary said. Yeah, I mean, you know, the climate, our, our, this huge momentum of climate change is not going away. Last year, I think it was a quarter of the world's top companies committed to being net zero by 2030. You know that wasn't just on a whim they see that as a major challenge for business so you know we can't be building a a assets that are already obsolescent if you like and that will need you know fixing to to minimize carbon so I, I just think you know the heat is still on and we have to take up that challenge as an industry and as i said before we can do that by making sure that the recovery plan that we have for the industry embraces those targets um you know and and there are lots of jobs that are coming along potentially from uh, green energy infrastructure um you know uh, uh, making sure our, our existing building stock which is after all our our biggest uh, infrastructure um is, is fit for purpose for, for for the climate change. Um, otherwise, we have a, a load of stranded assets, to use the, the buzzword, uh, and this is something which we can focus time and energy and techniques on, which we which we have at our disposal. We're just not uh, operationalizing them well enough at the moment. So, yeah, I think there's lots to be done, and and it gives hope for the for our future and our future generations, for that matter. Thank you, Lynn. Much appreciated. Mark, if we can, if we if we turn the dial a bit now in terms of thinking about modern methods of construction uh, within there, you know, what do you think how it plays its role within uh, COVID recovery within there? Do you think industry is ready to deploy it with there? Are we at a position in terms of readiness, technology readiness levels, the commercial models around about it, and that? So, and do you think actually we've got an opportunity to accelerate it in terms of the business models around about COVID recovery and stimulus? Yeah, so so I think um, the crisis has has probably put even more of a focus on adoption of modern methods of construction, and and, and by using that term, I, I'm using it across all seven of the categories that the British government have defined. So that ranges from sort of volumetric modular construction through to more part hybrid uh, elements of manufactured uh, uh, construction. Um, that you would see on a construction project, uh, all the way through also to digital construction tools used on uh, sites to uh, make operations more effective and efficient. So the, you know, the key issue here is how do you reduce dependency on on-site labour? And that has shown itself to be a major Achilles heel of the industry in this current crisis. And if we're going to build a more resilient industry that, that is capable of being more predictable, certainly if we have any element of recurrence of the current um, health emergency, then construction is going to be disproportionately affected if we don't change the methods by which we deliver um, in terms of sort of traditional dependency on doing everything at the final work phase. So I'm very much an advocate, uh, as you know, I've, I've been an advocate for, for a long time, but, but I, even more so now to get industry thinking about how do we change the processes, how do we change um, the, 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 the methods, how do we use technology to enable all of that, because it's really important that the manufacturing and technology go side by side. Um, because if we're going to increase pre-manufactured value, which is effectively what, what I advocate in terms of reducing site labour dependency, then we have a way of actually making our industry more resilient, um, more predictable, more attractive to clients in what's going to be really difficult times in, in relation to them committing to spend uh, in our industry going forward. Um, we can improve productivity, which has been a recurring issue in our industry. And, and, and I think you know, one of the things we need to be cautious of going back to my earlier statements is that I think in previous recessions or downturns, we've seen the routes to success or to survival was being uh, do it as cheap as you can. And we have to move away from that mindset. It's not about cheap. It's about making margin from efficiency and productivity. 
So you have to embrace that approach if you're going to be successful and come out the other side and have a sustainable business. And I think also, you know, we fundamentally need to be better assuring the quality um, and performance of our buildings, all built assets. And, and that's going to be really difficult if we keep doing it a traditional way where there's so much random, chaotic uh, uh, lack of process that you have on many construction sites. And I think it's timely today, the Construction Innovation Hub has launched its um, its new initiative for consultation, which is called the Construction Quality uh, Plan. Um, and, and, and CSIC is a, um, a Centre of Excellence Networks member of, of the CIH Transformer Construction Initiative, I think can play a really important part um, in driving that thinking, that, that, qual that quality planning thinking is what we need to bring into construction. It's not just for aircraft engines and automotive parts. It should be the way we think about how we build our buildings. And that's the only way we're going to better assure quality um, and um, uh, the performance of, of buildings. And just two, two or three things just to close. We do need new procurement models as well. Everything I've just said won't happen unless we rethink procurement. We do need government to stay aligned to a direction of travel around regulatory reform. And that includes carbon or decarbonisation. It includes issues around build quality and safety um, and doing that in a way that rebuilds public confidence in what, in what we're delivering. Uh, and then the insurance and finance markets that our industry is so dependent on need to be uh, incentivising us doing things better and not just funding and ensuring the same old, same old. If they actually start asking the right questions about what they're prepared to underwrite, then that drives our industry in a different direction. Mark, thank you for that. So if, if there's any season of Spain, you're going to see the second poll question now coming up to the fair. It's one of our quick polls. What lessons can the industry learn as a result of this crisis? So again, one to five, if you can select all that apply within there. And as you're doing that, we will now turn towards and so I'm back to Cumber Nods, like Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> uh, what role does public procurement, do you think, play in recovery? You know, we, we've heard from Mark in terms of the importance of procurement models in there. H how do we make sure that clients remain focused? We've, we've heard the importance of value for money and low carbon today. You know, how do we make sure we've got frameworks and, as Mark says, not re revert back to first past the post and lowest cost within there as well? Sure. Um... Well, I think the, the main role that public procurement plays is to ensure that the recovery is a clean and a just one. Um, so, you know, as, as Mark was saying and as Marie was saying, we need to spend in decisions should focus on creating quality local employment um, that delivers low carbon um, infrastructure and innovation um, and decarbonises the economy. Um, and the just element is particularly important in Scotland because there are an awful lot of people who are currently employed in jobs that rely on the fossil fuel industry. A lot of those jobs are highly skilled and those people need to be brought along um, and the public procurement decisions are going to uh, play a huge part in that. Um, there's obviously been you know, a, around a decade of um, legislation in the public sector um, that has required commitments to various things like improved working practices, better payment practices, um, increase the diversity, well-being, social value. And, and that was starting to make inroads into the private sector. Um, and I think the, the main thing is that there can't be any rollback on that. Um, and um, in fact, investors are continuing to drive it. So um, environmental, so social and governance reporting, ESG, um, has has massively gone up the agenda in a lot of the big banks and um, pension funds and investors, and um, they, they will continue to look for that. I mean, you saw on, on Friday, um, the leader in the Financial Times was calling for a green recovery. Um, similarly, in the in the Wall Street Journal. So, in terms of like focusing on value for money and not lowest cost, I think this short termism, focusing on um, you know what the pound sign is at the bottom of a fee quote, businesses just can't do that anymore because the, the cost has to be paid uh, somewhere, and you have to think about you know where where that is going to manifest itself. It might well be irreparable. Um, reputational damage further down the line. But I think one of the other things that the, the COVID-19 crisis has shown is that it's not just about reputation, it's also operational risk. Um, you know, this pushing things down supply chains and um, thinking that you can outsource that risk in the 
you know, effectively taking a gamble on a high impact, low probability event not happening, um, you know, you, you would uh, you would be a very rash and um, it would be a very rash business decision, I think, uh, from now on, and very reckless to think that you could continue doing business that way. Um, and the businesses that will survive and thrive will be the ones that invest in um, making their supply chains more resilient. And thank you for that, and uh, thank you to all the panellists for the, 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 their answers within this. So we've got some great questions uh, coming in from all those in line, so I hope everybody's enjoying their session here today. So our first one comes in from uh, one of our panellists, uh, Doug Morwood. And Mark, I'll maybe put this one to, to you if you can to maybe kick off. Uh, what part can public sector procurement play in catalyzing a positive change in the, in the construction industry within there with the leverage you've got? And actually, from your point of view, are, are you already starting to see, even prior to COVID, any change in ITTs or frameworks that are now starting to evidence, if you like, uh, a much more move towards a circular economy? You know, are we building innovation within there? Yeah, so I think the public sector spend has a massive role to play in catalyzing change in the industry, even though it's only 25-30% of total spend um, on built assets, certainly from a CapEx perspective, uh, it's hugely influential. And I think the client and, the, and, and I think um, government uh, has recognized the role that it can play in influencing change through its the, uh, the industrial strategy and the construction sector deal. So government leading from the front is a vital ingredient, I think, of our wider industry starting to change in and moving the right direction. So uh, in terms of how government spend programs are organized, how they're briefed from the very um, from the very outset. So a lot of decisions around whether you can innovate or not are made way before the procurement process. So we need to be thinking differently around how we design buildings, uh, how we think about downstream manufacturing, building performance, technology enablement. Um, and I think in answer to the question, like, am I seeing signs of that? I think from a central government perspective, you have government departments at varying stages of maturity in terms of recognising that imperative. We have a UK um, presumption in favour of uh, modern methods of construction in terms of the big um, five major spending government departments using MMC in its broadest sense. Yeah. So there is a, it's not effects, it's not quite a mandate, but it's a presumption in favour is good enough, I think, to for government departments to start doing the right thing. And we're seeing that with, for instance, Department for Education. We have a school building program that's starting to move rapidly towards manufacturing digital um, and decarbonisation as well. So that's all good stuff. There's a long way to go. Um, but I'm hopeful that actually if government continues its current track, then we'll see that starting to rub off into the private sector. So government trying to leverage towards a much more advanced, if you like, in terms of platform design and advanced manufacture. Lynn, maybe if we come across to yourself, do, do you think we're seeing the same in Scotland in terms of you know our devolved uh, nations? Do you think we're generally on the track to a true circular economy, especially in a, as we think about reinvention around about COVID? I think, well, echoing Mark's point, really, I think government has a big role to play in um, because they control so much of existing assets as well as and I think there are some interesting projects, uh, you know, which are going to drive, um, you know, the, an improved process of valuing up front the long term uh, values of climate change resilience, for example. So things like the procuring for value project that they're doing through the transforming construction program and yeah i i understand also um there's a, a major push on the circular economy and obviously public procurement could show the way in this and um i you know i think there's tremendous potential there but it's as yet unrealized Thank you for that, Lynn. Mary, question coming in uh, for yourself within there as well, sort of thing. You know, in, in terms of, you know, you, looking through your own lens, you know, ha have you seen a change in terms of how you're using remote working? And do you see, you think it will change the way you're going to work going forward as we, we start to move to a reset uh, within the industry? Yeah, I mean, we, I think about a week before close down, we saw working with a lot of our partners with more Zoom calls, et cetera, being carried out. I actually think um, COVID is, is obviously a terrible thing, but for me and personally my brand, 
what we actually have been pursuing for all this time is actually, I believe, truly a model in the face of COVID. Um, we have more folk um, working from home in local communities. We've got, for example, a fantastic partner in Anglesey and Strathairn that's coming in as one of their gold partners on our trading floor to help you start scale-ups. And then the hub in there, they're going to be uh, putting uh, three of their directors in there who come from Ayrshire. So I think that the, the model will change in where people work or where they want to be. Um, I'm a, an advocate of, of, of cities and towns and rurals coming together. For 30 years, I've listened to if we get cities right, the economic benefit will flow into towns and rural communities. And I'm sorry to say it doesn't. Um, I sit in the leadership board at Glasgow City Deal with Lord Hockey, which is a, a great organisation. The City Deal is amazing. We're involved in the Ayrshire Gross Deal. But let's start looking at our towns and rural communities. And, and post-COVID, how do we change the working environment? We can have more hubs in towns and creating job opportunities. Um, which will help with the zero carbon and all the transport issues that you have going up the, the M8, et cetera. So, you know, the, um, Mark was speaking earlier about uh, government and funding there. There's some great funds there at Innovate UK. Um, there was a challenge fund in 2018 that's still ongoing, and they spoke about construction. I would pinpoint folk to Innovate UK, um, and they, they launched their Clean Growth Challenge Fund. Scottish government, I mean, the governments, um, for me, have came together in COVID. They have put out some quick decision making. And as Alexander said at the beginning, if we can do it, then we can do it in the normal economy. Thank you, Mary. That, Alexander, that's that a nice sort of segue to yourself if you want to maybe build upon that one. We've not got much left, so if we can maybe just any short answers, really appreciate it. Yeah. The, so um, I think there's a couple of things here. And, and that's, that's the relation between built environment and, and transport. And if our transport infrastructure is going to be secure and maintain physical distancing uh, at, at two meters, that means that our capacity is going to be hugely reduced. We know it's you know down you know um, by our, and the peak down about ninety five percent in some aspects of the the network. And even if businesses open up and they want and people want to go into the office, they're not going to be able to. So, as Marie says, you know, we need to rethink about where people work because working from home is lovely on many occasions, um, depending on what sort of um, little interruption patters through the door, but it's not ideal for everyone. And therefore, how can we work near home? And what opportunity is there in the construction industry to rethink about um, working at those local communities, being able to work near their homes, driving uh, both kind of a, a local economic development from that perspective uh, and also um, localism in the supply chain and how do we actually look and review because if anything is has taught to us you know many of our businesses aren't resilient because of the reliance on their supply chains and where we get um, where we get our, our, our products from so I think things will absolutely change and one out of necessity but also We've almost broken the back of this digital working remotely. You know, it's been it's been a massive shock to us. But actually, for the most part, it's worked. Now we've got to shift to how do we make it more sustainable? And that's where that whole and your your point, Marie, around cities and driving generation. Actually, what's happening out of the big cities? How can we drive that sustainability and get people spending back in the local economy? Because they're working in the in the vicinity of their homes, not having to travel in. Thank you, Alexander. And we're we're getting into the closing minutes of this just now. But could you give us any final thoughts that you've got? You know, if, if you were working in their built environment just now, you know, what would be your main areas of focus for now, both short, medium, and long term? Again, but if you keep it a really succinct answer, that'd be fantastic. Um. I think just going back to what I said at the beginning, putting people at the heart of it and thinking about um, does it work for them? You know, there will be practical things like you know, we said about transport. Um, you know, some people have found working from home um, maybe a bit of a relief, or you know, uh, or there have been positives, but it, it's it's obviously very difficult for others, and for some people it's impossible. And people, you know, it, particularly now, but this will go on for a couple of years at least. People need to feel safe 
and I think that's what you know looking at making sure that um, we make improvements um, in, in, in buildings and infrastructure so that people can do what they need to do without feeling that they are putting themselves or their families or anyone else at risk. Um, and I think that that really is key. And if we can crack that, then um, a lot of good will come out of this. And thank you. And thank you to our panellists today for, for, for their input. With them. We've heard many things, digital is a neighbour, a convergence with modern methods of construction, but the need to keep value for money still within there. And the importance as we, we continue from reset to transformation, the importance of, of, net, of the zero carbon within there. Mark mentioned as well that word of assurance came through. We need to make sure that what we're is robust can be tested within there. The importance of government as a client, but I think above all, the thing that's kind of came out is it's still about people, value and purpose above there, but we can't take the goals of longer term transformation as well within there. So can I thank everybody for joining us today? And uh, I think we've got some really important questions that we've been through. So as I think from my point of view, a real insightful discussion. So thank you very much within there. We thank appreciate there's been a lot of questions that we've not been able to answer during the short time, but we'll take them on board and we'll try and answer them uh, through comms and through indeed other parts of the ICON platform as well within there. So a big thing we should say as well, the feedback that we've got from yourself, both through the questions and the polls that were ran, will be used as a basis for planning future ICON events and initiatives as well. So it's really important within there. So if you can complete the feedback forum, uh, please do within there and uh, and you'll receive this event. But again, if I can, uh, meantime, I forget then that you do visit the ICON platform and follow CSIC for ongoing updates and support, that'd be great. So our main thing is stay safe, stay positive, collaborate, use your tools if in there. And again, you know, please innovate. I think the future is still bright and it's still one I think that's heading towards transformation. So thank you and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye.